I'd like to call the meeting to order of the Veterans and Military Affairs Finance and Policy Committee. It is March 20th. Um, Representative Bliss, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. Thank you. And I see uh, Representative Olson is not with us today. My understanding is that he's with his family. His wife is giving birth. Uh, so uh, we give him early congratulations. Um, First up today, we have two bills before us today. Uh, one is moving forward and the other is an informational bill. Is uh, Representative Hill here? Yes, if you'd come forward, please. Yeah, okay. And while you're doing that, uh, if uh, Representative Clardy, have you had a chance to review the minutes? I have. Okay, would you like to move the minutes, please? So moved. Okay. The minutes have been moved. Is there any discussion at all? Seeing none, the minutes for the uh, previous meeting are approved. Thank you. <coughs> Representative Hill, welcome to the committee. Uh, please identify yourself and uh, give us your testimony. Well, thank you, Chair Newton, and thank you to the members of the committee. My name is Josiah Hill, and I represent District 33B in the East Metro, and I'm joined here today uh, I'm thrilled to be joined here today with uh, retired Army Colonel Ron Miller and retired Sergeant Mark Fenneman, uh, who are instrumental in the work that they've done uh, to move forward with this plan for a Veterans Memorial in, in Forest Lake, Minnesota. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to share is that uh, the work that's been done over the last 15 plus years uh, is in tribute uh, to a stalwart in the community, <coughs> L. Ewart. And uh, he was a World War II veteran, and he's going to be prominently uh, play a prominent role in this memorial uh, once it is realized and completed. The work we'll share with you today is the result of hard work by not just uh, Mr. Miller and Mr. Fenneman next to me, uh, but by a group of folks, uh, committed folks up in Forest Lake. And their vision that they're going to share with you here in a moment of uh, creating this gathering space in kind of the crown jewel of all spaces in Forest Lake. It's right along the, the lakefront, uh, right where uh, Broad, for those of you that are familiar, where Broadway uh, intersects with the lake. And so I'm thrilled again to be here uh, with Colonel Miller and uh, the project designer, retired Sergeant Mark Fenneman, and they're gonna share a few more details uh, with you about the project. We also have up on the screen, and you also have in your packet some of the renderings um, that have been created of, of this uh, memorial. And so we'd like to share that as we seek your support in an appropriation to help complete this project. Thank you. Thank With you, Representative uh, Hill. And I move that House Committee uh, File uh, 2470 be re referred to the House Capital Investment Committee after we hear the testimony here. Mr. Miller, if you'd like to uh, proceed and identify yourself for the uh, record, please. Yes, Ron Miller. Besides being a retired Army Colonel, I had, I had seven years active duty and then 18 years in the Minnesota Army National Guard flying the uh, Hueys out of St. Paul for the most of that, and then uh, in the Army Reserves for my last five uh, years of my career. But uh, I became the, the volunteer uh, chaplain of the Forest Lake American Legion Post, <coughs> and Al Ewart came to me and said, Ron, we need to have a, a Veterans Memorial. There, at the time, there was a plaque that had a list of uh, 24 names on it that the uh, Forest Lake uh, Chamber of Commerce had put together right after the Vietnam War. And uh, that plaque was you know, about a foot and a half long and a foot or so wide. And uh, we need to get that installed again in the Lakeside Memorial Park. Um, it was after a park renovation, just like in 2008. And uh, I said, okay, let's start a committee. So we started a, a committee um, Bob Detmer was one of the ones on that, and the mayor and a bunch of other people. Anyway, the point is um, we got that plaque all situated, and then we decided that we needed a, uh, uh, some, some way to get some, some money, donations or whatever, for honoring the, the veterans. So we came up with the idea of having pavers. Now, this is the small paver that uh, people could buy, uh, or one that's, this is, four inches by eight inches, then there's another one that's eight inches by, 
16 inches. So anyway, people could do that, and so we've been selling these pavers since, uh, you know, like about 2009. Um, I call the, the people <coughs> that have ordered them uh, and say, what do you want, you know, to say on these, on the paver? And we've got that, that system has been going on since then, and we have 337 pavers so far. And so with, with those donations and, uh, and also some other donations, we've got over $60,000 uh, so far. So the next step is going to the next phase, which is having upright pieces with our, these pavers are just on the, on the ground next <coughs> to the sidewalk. Um, and so, um, so anyway, we brought in, uh, Mark uh, Finneman is an architect uh, by trade and he's retired now from that. And so anyway, Mark uh, is, uh, is one that really um, put things together to come up with a new design and let's go from there. Yes. Welcome, Mr. Finneman. If you'd like to identify yourself for the record, please. Yes, yeah, Mark Finneman, uh, Forest Lake. I've served during the NAM era, so I'm not, not necessarily retired, but I served my time. I was part of the um, Forest Lake EDA, Economic Development Authority, and there was a whole host of us who were working on downtown redevelopment at that time and trying to come with uh, whatever our future for the downtown park and otherwise could be. Uh, one of the biggest issues for us was it's not a strong statement there presently relative to displaying the pavers and uh, and as a memorial it's, it's just not as strong as we wanted to see it so the whole idea was let's elevate those pavers to a much better position and uh, let's create something in the downtown area where we um, we really do have a memorial that's worth coming to it's probably the most dramatic space in forest lake right there at the memorial downtown lakeside park and this is probably the best place to have that kind of public display display of some kind of fine arts or some kind of memorial that's got some real significance to it. So the whole idea was let's build significance into this story. So if you wanted to run through the slides, if you can see them, the first slide, if you're not, if you're not familiar with Forest Lake, just note that it's part of the downtown park and right off our main intersection in the downtown area. The idea of the, the uh, we already started with this idea of pavers, so therefore that sets the stage for this whole thing. So we elevate the pavers in three circular kind of platforms that are raised only about 16 inches off the ground. They <coughs> surround a kind of concourse area. That's probably the best slide if you can back off it a little bit just to see what the whole uh, idea <coughs> looks like. Um, so there's a center concourse, sort of an observation territory that will have an upgrade to the sidewalks that's got pavers on it. Central to that is a, uh, a vertical sculpture that has a seating area around it, so there's a pedestal that raises it off the ground. And then the sculpture begins from that point on. And then the three segments that are surrounding it are the raised platforms. And on two of those segments, we have six sentinels, we call them, in that there's an obelisk that kind of leans in toward the center sculpture. And on each of those is one of those services represented. On both sides, there would be a logo of the services represented on each side. There's a slide in the future here that can show you how those various sentries like that look like. So they're, they're kind of architectural. They lean in. They're working around and, and centrally <coughs> focused on that center sculpture. And the idea of this whole thing is to declare the services, to raise and pre present a much more uh, appealing platform for the uh, pavers, and then to uh, there's a real world vision of it like that. There's a couple real world visions of it. So it's low rise, people could see through it to the rest of the park. It allows plenty of circulation, didn't really take away from any circulation in the park, allows some seating area in the park, and I think becomes a really strong feature that really declares this as a memorial, more so than we've ever done before. And so that's been the goal all through this, is to create those kinds of imagery. I think the central sculpture has a theme behind it, uh, without going into too much detail, it's essentially, it's a rock outcropping, much like you'd find in Minnesota North Shore, uh, maybe an old cypress tree evolving out of it that's kind of sculptural and from that there are two eagles that are presented. Uh, we hope to do bronze castings of those eagles so they're as lifelike as possible and those bronze castings of the eagles would sit upon that tree in two different kind of action modes and facing in different directions of the park so there's no one direction that you see this from, you see it from all directions. So I think it's a really good partner to the park. Uh, and I think it's a strong visual statement and uh, we just really wanted to pay honor to the veterans who have served and I think this does it. The American flag is prominent, the eagles are prominent, 
the two biggest symbols we seem to have. And then beyond that, it's, uh, I think it's a gesture that's really strong and, and it covers a lot of ground. So Thank you, Mr. Vinnie. Yes, Mr. Miller. So part of the uh, uh, outcropping in the, in the rocks and whatever is think about battlefields and the chaos of battlefields and the demolition and, and whatever damage. And then out of that is this growing tree, growing green that comes and <coughs> two eagles being you know, the U.S. symbol for one thing, but also a symbol of, of peace and, and uh, uh, democracy or freedom. So that's what, what that center keeps another piece of yeah. the The goal is to be as fine art as we can possibly be, you know, within limits, and to express something that's got a strong patriotic theme to it. Good. Well, thank you. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to testify? Uh, seeing none, I open it up to the uh, committee. Is there anyone on the committee that has any questions or concerns? Representative Bliss. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Hill, I, uh, veterans memorials are uh, very important, I think, and uh, especially to to ensure that we, we don't forget and, and, you know, for the grandparents to take their grandkids to walk them and maybe, you know, get a story started. Um, in that respect, it's, you know, it's, it's part of legacy. And, and have you considered running a side-by-side uh, -side bill with legacy to, you know, additional funding you know, just in case this one doesn't go through? Representative. Thank you, Chair Newton. Thank you, Representative, for the question. We, we are seeking any and all pathways, and so I would be very open to connecting with the Legacy Committee as well if that's a pathway that's recommended. Okay. Representative Weens. Uh, thank you, Chair Newton. Uh, <coughs> Representative Hill, Mr. Miller, Mr. Fenneman. Um, I've just, uh, I, I agree with my colleague here uh, that this is a, it's a legacy piece. Um, and it's important for our communities to commemorate uh, those that have sacrificed uh, some and some have sacrificed all. Um, I've got a question on what the 225000 does in, in, you know, what the total cost of the project is and, and how much of the paver input would be if it's a it's sort of a 50-50 match on that. Mr. Miller? Yes, yes Mr. Chair. The, um, it's a 50-50. We, we estimate the cost to be about 450000 uh, there's some <coughs> stuff that has to happen underneath it because there's a few pipes there. The city is going to handle that. Um, but anyway, the the cost of the things and then the one of the prominent things is that that uh, a statue of the likeness of this uh, Al Ewert. He was about six foot seven or so, and it's going to be we're going to have a statue there, and he's <coughs> going to be in his World War II uniform, uh, stat bronze statue or whatever, and saluting. Not only saluting the flag, but then also on the other side of the flag is all of the the rest of the memorial pieces, or whatever. So it's kind of saying that you know a job well done. And <coughs> behind him is the roundabout when you're downtown Forest Lake, Highway 61, and then Broadway. So when somebody looks towards the lake, they'll see they'll see that you know him saluting and and, and whatever. So, uh, but Mr. Finnegan, and we have. Uh, broken down the cost. We had, did try to take some preliminary bids of all of this so that we could understand it better. And so we do know what our paper costs are, what our groundwork is, what some of the prep work is, moving utilities out from under us, and the sculptural cost. We put some price tags against the sculptural cost as well so that we can really stand behind this option. About 450 could cover this entire game with some latitude move products and such systems around us. And we're still going to be selling the uh, pavers will <laughs> still continue on, and they'll be in the other, you know, in the other piece of parts. But instead of being on the ground, they'll be up. All the old pavers do the same thing. We'll put all of them up, and so it'll be a continuing, uh, continuing thing. Good. Are there any other questions or concerns? Good. I, I think Representative Hill, it might be a good idea to consider looking at a, a separate bill going to Legacy in addition to this one. But seeing no further discussion, uh, I renew my motion that House File 2470 be re referred to House Capital Investment Committee. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Oh, we have to vote. <laughs> <laughs> all in favor of moving House 2470 to uh, Capital Investment, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. You're on your way, Representative Hill. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.
Okay, next we have Representative Morris. And committee, Representative Norris has a bill. This is an informational only bill, so the bill is not going anywhere, but it's to let the committee know what we're, what we're doing and what we're looking at at the National Sports Center. Representative Norris, if you'd like to uh, introduce your bill, please. Uh, thank you, Chair Newton. Um, pleased to uh, be presenting House File 587. Uh, the National Sports Center lies right in the heart of my district, and it's the largest amateur sports facility in the world. Uh, many of you may know it from spending hours out on the soccer pitches watching your kids play soccer, or maybe you've even played there yourself, but uh, there's a lot more to the sports center um, than, than just that. Uh, it draws four million visitors uh, world from across the world every year, making it the second largest tourist attraction in the state of Minnesota, right behind uh, the Mall of America. It's also home to the largest soccer tournament in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, it serves as the training center for the U.S. Olympic women's hockey team, as well as the Minnesota United FC. Uh, it's overall, it's a 700-acre campus that's got 60 soccer fields. It's got the second largest ice arena in the world. Uh, it's, you can use it for basketball, volleyball. There's a golf course. Uh, there's uh, fields for baseball and soccer. Um, but one thing that, that is, you know, we'd like to see more of is opportunities to engage people in adaptive sports there. Uh, whether those are our veterans, whether they're other folks who want to avail themselves of adaptive sports, uh, we think that there's an opportunity to add to uh, the facility at the National Sports Center and do it in conjunction uh, with the folks who represent uh, the National Rugby. Uh, they've, they've come with a really uh, exciting vision uh, that would not only promote the opportunity to host rugby events at the Sports Center, uh, but as I mentioned, it would be really the first truly adaptive uh, field and, and complex that we have at this premier facility in our state. Uh, I think it's a really great vision, one that I'm excited to support, and we've got a number of testifiers who are going to help paint that vision for you and, and talk about why this would benefit not just uh, my district, but really uh, the state of Minnesota. Good. Thank you, Representative Norris. And uh, Mr. Keeley, if you'd like to introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony, please. Hi, uh, Joe. <laughs> you have to pay uh, for that, John. So, uh, Joe Kyle, I'm with the group Rugby Unified, and we can answer questions about that. But uh, first, I'd like permission, uh, Chairman, to uh, have uh, the committee be able to actually uh, feel what a rugby what rugby balls are like. Both uh, if the page would uh, get that, please. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just just try not to drop it. That's a that's not a good thing in rugby. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, present to you today. HF five eighty seven re represents both a vision and a plan. The vision is of a place like no other in the world that would draw people from throughout the world to Minnesota. The plan is for the first barrier free experience designed for athletes of all abilities, including caregivers, families, and fans. And what it delivers is a combination of social and economic impact that uh, is significant. From a social standpoint, uh, as Representative Norris stated, this would be the first athletic facility designed from the ground up to uh, provide a barrier-free experience for those athletes. And it would uh, serve the underserved sports of wheelchair rugby, also wheelchair basketball, power hockey, Paralympic volleyball, uh, and, it, and it goes on. Uh, and it's, um, uh, when we came up with this, it was uh, really based in the foundation of rugby as a very inclusive sport. And, uh, and then uh, we were able to then put some numbers to it, leveraging the programming capabilities of the National Sports Center. In our very first conversation, they asked, how can you help us organize the world's largest rugby tournament? And the world's largest soccer tournament that they run 
delivers an annual economic impact on its own of, of $35 million annually. We have a conservative starting point for that and then a number of other tournaments, but leveraging those programming capabilities, initially we'd have an annual economic impact of $6 million uh, for both adaptive and, and non-adaptive sports. We think it's in a unique opportunity for Minnesota to demonstrate how social and economic impact can complement one another. Uh, when we began this journey three and a half years ago when we approached the National Sports Center, they asked us to think big about this unused 18 acre parcel on their campus. Uh, so we've done that. <laughs> and uh, and, and we, we, we really feel like it's an exciting experience or, or opportunity I should say. Um, also very realistic in terms of the programming. Um, we've only started our initial discovery. We've, we've done, uh, 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 I think, uh, uh, what you need to do at this point from getting input from adaptive and non-adaptive athletes, uh, caregivers, families, fans, uh, but we've only just begun. We have <coughs> reached out to veterans organizations um, such as the National Veterans Wheelchair Games, had a good discussion with them, um, and the VA Adaptive Sports and Arts. Uh, you know, but uh, as I said, uh, our, our journey really has, has just started. So we've, we've done enough to um, feel very confident in both the social and economic impact. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, just turn it over to um, Robert Ewart, who uh, has been our consultant from the start. Uh, he works with a number of mission-driven organizations just to talk a little bit about what we mean by, about barrier-free. Mr. Ewart, if you'd like to come forward and identify yourself for the record, please. <clears throat> My name is Robert Ewart. Uh, I will say that I am not of any relation to the previous Ewart that was <laughs> just complete incidental, but I will be looking up L. Ewart uh, this afternoon when I do get home. Um, as, as Joe said, you know, I think the opportunity here at the National Sports Center is to, is to design an experience for all. And in this particular arena, we're gonna talk a little bit about barrier-free design. Uh, we, can, we won't get into too many details, but we have a basic concept of what barrier-free means. Um, the vision of the National Rugby Center is to provide a barrier-free environment that will allow free and safe movement, function, and access for athletes, family, caregivers, and friends. Um, just getting to the facility today, there are many barriers that um, we believe in a new facility we can, we can address through good design. The center will provide spaces that can be accessed by all without obstacles. That is one of the big driving <coughs> forces behind a barrier-free uh, concept as opposed to just an accessible concept. Um, the design includes uh, a number of barrier-free uh, strategies as you see on, on the cover of your page. We can get into more detail through the uh, questions uh, and answer <coughs> session about some of the concepts we've looked at. But just initially, you'll see at the south entrance, um, from the time you arrive um, at the facility, um, whether you're going to the, the outdoor rugby fields or you're going to the athletic court inside, all the programming that will be accessed by families, friends, and athletes will be barrier free in concept. Um, and that's just sim removing very simple obstacles that you find in everyday building. Um, with that, I wanna make sure I get this right, Barb, because you have quite a, quite a list of things. So Barb will be next. She's a USA Women's National Team player, 1991 World Cup champion, USA Rugby Hall of Fame as a player and a coach, and has every award there is in USA Rugby <laughs> that demonstrates the at attributes that makes this a great game. Good. Thank you. Thank Ms. Frugate, if you would identify yourself for the record Barbara as well. Barbara Fugate, I live in Bloomington, Minnesota, blocks from that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for your time. So you've got our proposal in front of you. It's a great proposal. You might be wondering a little bit why you're hearing about this kind of ambitious vision from rugby people. What's the connection between this facility and the community of rugby? And that's what it's a picture we want to paint for you a little bit more fully today so you understand this. Rugby is a, it's a world sport and it's everyone's sport. It is played in 123 countries in the world, 10 million people at least, 40 countries have wheelchair teams. The uh, 
the barrier for entry is low for youth rugby, which is one of the reasons it's played so widely. You just need a patch of grass and a ball, literally, and that's why it's such an international sport. It's also a gender inclusive sport, very much so. Women and girls play by the exact same rules as men and boys. Girls and boys play together in the touch version of the game, and as you get older, of course, they're segregated. But collegiate women and collegiate men play by the same rules. World Cup women and World Cup men play by the same rules, same pitch, same contact rules, same ball, everything. And that gives us, and it gives every, every rugby player the opportunity to learn all the same lessons from rugby. There's no watering it down. And one of the things that, one of the real foundational principles in rugby, which is one of the reasons I fell in love with it, is the concept of selflessness. In rugby, unlike really many other sports that you see, you can't do anything alone. One person can't accomplish anything by themselves on a rugby pitch. In order to advance the ball, in order to defend, in order to accomplish any of the things you try to accomplish in a match, you have to do it in close coordination with the person on the left and the person on your right and all the way out. So it is one of the most selfless competitive games you could, you could teach to your children. It also teaches physical courage because it is a hard physical <coughs> game and it teaches mental toughness. So those principles really make up the ethos of our game and, and create this rugby community, the camaraderie in the rugby community that I think is very unique in the world. It gives us an opportunity to develop those traits in young women and young men alike. Um, I had the <coughs> chance to coach under 19 and under 23 national team elite development players, both men and women. And uh, I have to tell you, to a person, every one of those young athletes I worked with understands selflessness in a way that would, that would just make you smile. If you ever wanna be encouraged about the future of, of our community, hang out with some of those young athletes at some point in your life because they are nothing short of inspiring. They understand selflessness, they understand what it means to be a great teammate, they understand what it means to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And those are traits that, that are really irreplaceable. The traits of physical courage, it was a little bit less consistent. This is one of the points I want to make about it being a gender inclusive sport. What I discovered and many of the coaching staff discovered was that for some young women, they had had very few opportunities in their life to that point to really learn to tap into their own physical courage, to be okay with it, to learn how to test it. Whereas young men have those opportunities more often or certainly have in many cases. And so we would have a young woman that we've selected to this elite player development pipeline, 5'10", 190 pounds, very athletic, strong, perfect frame for rugby. And she would be at the camp and she would not want to write down her weight. She didn't want to have to tell us how much she weighed. Really, this still happens. And it's because these young women are still growing up in a world where in their mind, it's not really okay to be a 21 year old woman and weigh 190 pounds. So imagine the opportunity for us then to really work with these athletes to start to improve uh, their self-confidence, turn that negative body image around to a positive body image so these athletes then can really learn to be comfortable in their own skin, learn to really test themselves, learn to um, actually embrace their strength and their ability to compete at a high level and that's an important development process for, for all those athletes. Now the concept of selflessness and physical courage and mental toughness that <coughs> might resonate with some of you who served in the armed services uh, because these are the very traits that we work hard to develop in military training. Um, the, it's not a coincidence that our military academies, the Air Force Academy, West Point, and Annapolis fielded rugby teams long before other colleges in the country field the rugby teams. In fact, in 1991, 32 years ago, it's the first time we rolled out, uh, we held the first US National Collegiate Championship for women. And so our first national collegiate champions were the women from the Air Force Academy. And that's not a coincidence. Um, I was a Marine officer and I thought I knew something about mental toughness because I'd been a lifelong athlete all my you know, life up to that point. I was pretty sure I had that figured out until I went to Quantico. <laughs> um, so these traits really that define the camaraderie of our rugby community also make rugby a natural community for service members and for veterans. Imagine returning home from a long deployment where you've been immersed in this situation where you're 
working day in and day out with the people on your left and the people on your right and they're doing the same for you. It, is, it requires some physical courage and it requires a lot of mental toughness to get through those long deployments. And you've been immersed in this kind of environment and you come home and all of that is just gone. That's, it leaves a hole in your life. And rugby is one of the places where we can fill that, fill that need to belong to something bigger than yourself, to be around people who are gonna work side by side with you and who understand those traits of physical courage and mental toughness. And even further, imagine that you're coming home from a long deployment and you've been injured. You've been seriously injured to the degree that it's gonna change your life. There are things you're gonna have to do differently now. You still have a home in rugby. We still have adaptive and wheelchair rugby teams and we want you to play. So now there's a place, not only you can go to be a part of something bigger than yourself, but you can be around people who understand your selflessness and your commitment, who understand your physical courage, who see your mental toughness and who embrace you for it. So that is the, that's the nature of the rugby community that we want you to understand about us. Um, and I mentioned there's a low barrier you know, to enter youth rugby. It is not a low barrier to play wheelchair rugby. It has never been a low barrier. And that is one of the things that we're asking you to help us find a way to change. Um, I mentioned mental toughness, and there is somebody that you need to meet. There's a man here who is an icon of our sport, truly. Uh, he was on the USA, Rug the national wheelchair rugby team for 13 years. He's now the head coach of the USA national wheelchair rugby team. Three-time world championship medalist, two-time Paralympic medalist, and to us, this guy is a legend. I want you to meet Joe Delagrave. Thank you, Mr. Fugain. And Mr. Delgrave, if also if you would identify yourself for the record, please, and then proceed. Yeah, yeah, my name is Joe Delagrave. Um, and I want to talk to you guys a little bit about adaptive sports. Um, the barrier-free concept to us, there's three things that come to mind. Um, number one is inclusion. Um, I, I grew up playing sports my entire life, played uh, college football for Winona State University uh, as a tight end. I was about a cheeseburger away from being a tackle, but that's <laughs> nonetheless there. Uh, didn't know they were fatting me up, but, uh, but in between my freshman and sophomore years, ended up um, acquiring an injury on the Mississippi River in a boating accident where I broke my neck at the C6 and 7 level, um, rendering me a quadriplegic. And uh, thought athletics was over for me. And uh, about a year and a half after that, and had some buddies that threw me on a scale, and I realized I was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I needed to find some, some recreational activities to do. And uh, so I Googled them. I found, uh, I found wheelchair basketball and realized that probably wasn't the best sport for me, uh, given my uh, level of injury. And then I found wheelchair racing and remembered that I never wanted to run uh, around a track <laughs> in circles. I'd rather, <laughs> rather eat asparagus than have to do that. Um, and then found wheelchair rugby. And kind of the vision of, of the video that I pressed play on was complete clickbait. It was basically disabled people smashing into each other, <laughs> trying to make each other more disabled. It was an oxymoron. Uh, or I was the moron that went and, uh, <laughs> went, to, went and over to Golden Valley at, at Courage, uh, Kenny, now Courage, uh, used to be Courage Center, and, and fell in love with the sport called wheelchair rugby. Um, the beautiful thing about a barrier-free facility is that inclusion is actually integration. Um, that's the second point there is when you, when you have inclusion that's truly barrier-free, like a facility like this, you're gonna have able-bodied men, able-bodied women, able-bodied young boys, able-bodied young girls, um, disabled athletes of all different ages as well come together underneath one roof and compete together. Um, for me, I think there was um, a time where, gosh, uh, it was awesome over at Courage Kenny. It was great to be there, but it was separate. Um, and I think a barrier-free facility truly integrates, um, integrates rugby in a beautiful way. We say a lot, rugby is for all. We might have different rules than able-bodied rugby does, but rugby is for all. And I think the concept of it is camaraderie, coming together um, and really truly competing. Uh, competition, I think, can be a conduit for uh, people, especially in my community, for people with adaptive sports that um, come in and they find that recreation leads to rehabilitation. Um, I didn't learn how to be independent in my wheelchair or become a, an, an adaptive athlete or how to do 
leadership at, at the USA level sitting in a hospital room. I did it on the rugby court. I did it through recreation that turned into rehabilitation that turned into competition that turned into, an, into a conduit um, for success. I've been fortunate enough to, um, to coach some men and women that have served in our armed forces through um, some work with the US Navy as well as some work with the Oscar Mike Foundation that keeps injured military veterans on the move across the country through uh, recreation activities. Some of them even jump out of airplanes. Um, I, for one, have already broke my neck, so I don't need to have any more crazy <laughs> injuries like that. But, um, but what I've found out is that these men and women that have served our country, that have given um, some of their physical capabilities, whether it's through an acquired spinal, spinal cord injury or been blown up and, and come home losing limbs, is that the sport offers them an outlook on life that they didn't have before. The sport offers them a camaraderie and a group that builds them up when they need it, that pulls them back when they need it as well. Um, true integration, true barrier free. Lastly, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Um, 79 years ago, my grandfather was part of uh, a group of 16 men that went into Robert E. Small's camp over in Force, uh, over in uh, over at the Great Lakes um, training facility, and 16 of them. Um, worked for eight weeks to become the first black commissioned officers in the Navy. Uh, my, my grandfather, um, Frankie Sublette, was one of them. And I remember talking to my grandfather before he passed away about what that meant to him. And he had hemmed and hawed, and then he was like, ah, well, you know, they stuck us on a ship in Virginia. We didn't get to go to war. We didn't get to do that, you know. I was like, Grandpa, like, you really cracked the door open for uh, men of color, and shortly thereafter, women in the armed forces. You were, you, were, uh, you were truly a champion of that cause, and, and he kind of hemmed and hawed a little bit more and everything, and I just remember talking to him about the idea of cracking the door open. Um, I think this facility can do this. It can crack the door open and lead to change <coughs> lives. Um, I think you know, being able to be a true barrier-free facility, being able to be a true facility where we can be integrated together leads to us cracking the door open, whether it's a young man or young woman or an adaptive sport athlete coming in and change their lives just by having the door open very free. Thank you guys. Um, I want to introduce Dwayne, who is uh, Dwayne, who is the former chairman of the Minnesota uh, Amateur Sports Commission. He's a Hall of Fame member of the Met Metropolis Rugby Football Club and a commercial real estate entre entrepreneur, including ownership of Solar Arts Building in Minneapolis. Thank you, Mr. Delegate. Mr. Ahrens, if you'd like to identify yourself for the record, please. My name is Dwayne Ahrens. First of all, I want to say how great were those presentations by Joe and Laura. Like yeah. Sit back there just in, in awe of those guys. But uh, uh, Chairman Newton and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the Veterans Committee, thank you very much for, for having all of us here today. Again, my name is Dwayne Arns. I'm the former chair of the Minnesota Amateur Sports Commission, and I've seen firsthand the, the significant impact that amateur sports can have on the region and the state. The National Rugby Center project is an exciting development that will add an already impressive economic impact to the National Sports Center, uh, which we've heard is already attracts 4 million people and it generates over $6 million annually. And the National Rugby Center We do have letters of support from Anolta County. We got letters of support from the city of Blaine, from the Metro North Chamber of Commerce, from Meet Minneapolis, from USA Rugby, etc. So we've kind of demonstrated our ability to be a strong partner in this, in this endeavor. So one of the primary goals of the National Sports Center is to use it up, is to utilize amateur sports as an economic development tool. And I think this visit is perfect. With all the uh, stakeholders that this is a win-win situation for everybody. The National Rugby Center will be self-sufficient. And when I was the chairman, that was, that was always a real big deal to us that, uh, you know, we got no operating funds from the state of Minnesota. This is a one-time money that will come in. This will generate tax revenue for the state of Minnesota. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's part of that reason that I think the, this is a great project. And there isn't, I can't 
can't think of any other place in the whole world where this project should be with the National Sports Center, the largest amateur sports <coughs> complex in the whole world. It'll be right here in Minnesota. So I urge you to support the National Rugby Project and thank you for your time today. Thank you. If you have any questions, we're happy to take them. Thank you, uh, Mr. Aarons. Representative Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> and I actually have two questions about the wheelchair rugby, if um, if I could ask them. And just out of curiosity more than anything, but I noticed the two balls obviously are very differently shaped weight and so on. So what is the purpose of the differently shaped ball and weight and so on? Mr. Dillagrave? Yeah, the uh, wheelchair rugby ball uh, was made up as basically a, a sport that was made up by quadriplegics in Canada in 1977 that were sitting on the sidelines for wheelchair rugby and thought they would create a sport that was a little bit more uh, conducive for them. And so they ended up using what looked like a volleyball. Uh, and so that's that's exactly <laughs> kind of what it looks like now today. I think it's over there. But, um, and so our, our sport is played by different rules and on a basketball court. Um, but rugby ended up being the, the perfect name for for our sport and has been a great community to partner with. Uh, it used to be called murder ball, as you can see. Uh, that's <laughs> probably not as, as great. Uh, <laughs> to, to get tall for people. But uh, yeah, so wheelchair rugby, and then we ended up using what looks like a volleyball. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Chair, thank yeah. you. And you actually kind of answered my second question, which was what type of surface that you play on. Um, so I take it you must um, maybe bounce the ball more or, and so on. It's just really neat to hear the history and how the creativity of somebody just saying, hey, let's create a sport. And But can you explain a little yeah. more how Mr. that works? Delegate. Please. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's very innovative where they just created it. And it's played on a basketball court, four on four. There's two goals on each end. Uh, we don't use the basketball uh, field goals or anything like that. So those are up. And then we have two cones on each end. The the, the, the key that we play in um, is measured about eight meters wide. Um, and and so once you score and cross that, that's one, one goal. Uh, the games get up to 50 to 60 goals per game. So it's a very offensive game and uh, fast flowing. And then for... Is to give you an example of how, how much pushing goes on in our wheelchairs. It's um, about five to six miles if you play it, play an entire game, uh, obviously sprinting and, and stopping. So. Oh, and Mr. Chair, if I might ask one more. Um, with um, So with the sports center then, would the um, wheelchair rugby court be outside and more of a, a hard surface or would it still remain inside like a basketball court would? <laughs> Mr. Delegate. Yeah, thankfully it would be in, in housed indoors. Okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> outside would be fun uh, a couple of months out of the year, but yeah, <laughs> but uh, but definitely indoors, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Members in the audience, does anyone have any, uh, any anything to say? Seeing none, uh, I, I want to thank you, Representative Morris, for bringing this forward. Um, this, this is interesting, and uh, I think it was probably two years ago that Mr. Aarons approached me about rugby and let me know that there's a category of 60 and over that can play rugby. Um, he didn't quite get up to my age group. But, <laughs> but it, it's adaptive, you know, to, to various ages and also for our K-12 community. We have a lot of students that, that have disabilities and are want to be active, more active in sports. And this facility will lend itself to that sort of thing. So, um, again, thank you for coming up. And Representative Hudella. I just thought, late to the game with the question, Chair. Um, thank you. Just curious if the group has uh, reached out to DAB or PVA at all. Um, uh, just a couple of great resources, disabled American veterans and the um, paralyzed veterans, just as, as a resource to, hey, this is coming and, and we want to give these additional veterans opportunities with it. Mr. Keelan. Uh, we have reached out. I have reached out to probably 30 different uh, adaptive and related uh, support organizations. We haven't had a response from everybody. Uh, I would love to follow up to find out more about uh, that representative Fudella, um, the ones that you mentioned. I'm not familiar, I, I can't remember offhand if I actually reached out to those. 
uh, but without a lot of contacts. Um, Joe is really our chief contact with wheelchair, wheelchair rugby. Um, but uh, and, and I should mention that uh, there's also uh, unified rugby, which is uh, 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 teams that are comprised of uh, cog uh, that include uh, athletes who have cognitive cognitive challenges, and that's played outside also. So that's just another example of how you know we we've tried to reach out to these communities. Um, I don't have all the contacts, but I would love to follow up with with those two and and get your help. Good. Seeing no further questions, uh, thank you, Representative Norris. If you would like to wrap something up, if you'd like to. Yeah, well, thank you, Chair Newton. I appreciate the opportunity to have a hearing on this bill. I don't know that I could say anything better than, than these folks have, but I just you know, want to thank uh, Rugby Unified uh, for bringing this vision and, and including the, the accessible, adaptive, barrier-free facility as part of it. Um, you know, they could have just come to us and said we want to create some rugby fields, and instead they had a much better and, and bigger vision that's going to serve Minnesotans of all abilities. And I think that's just uh, fantastic and uh, would encourage you to put in a good plug with our capital investment chair if you think this is a great idea. <laughs> thank you. I will do that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and thank you all again. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our meeting. I don't know if we're going to be meeting anymore. Uh, actually, we don't have any bills that are before us. We do have to do the omnibus. Yeah, we have to do the omnibus bill. But I mean, um, that's about the only thing that we that we still need to do that I know of. Unless you do, John, if you know of anything. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the thing. And and we have a question as to whether our omnibus uh, is going to be combined with state gov or whether we're going to go separately. And I've had discussions with. Um, Rep or Senator Murphy in the Senate, and in the Senate, state gov and veterans are together. So I'm hoping that we can pull a bill out of their committee and just run a separate bill. Uh, so s stay tuned. Uh, I, I don't know when we'll meet again, but yes, Representative Blitz. So Mr. Chair, as long as you have the speakers here, if you could uh, get her to lobby for us as well on that uh, veterans omnibus bill. Stand yes, along. I, I have spoken with her about it already. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, seeing no further uh, discussion, uh, the committee is adjourned.